Good morning, everybody. Um, today we have Charles Alexander with the, you know, um, with the, oh my God, I'm so sorry, with it's the okay. Tennessee Small Business Development Center. And um, Charles, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? I certainly will, and don't feel a bit bad. Even though we're really good at marketing and branding, whoever named us, all of the continents in the world might not have been. Uh, so I'm Charles Alexander. I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center right here at Ball State Community College. And I have been in this role uh, just a little over 14 years. And what we do is really simple, but very effective. We offer free one-on-one -on -one business coaching for anybody that owns a business or wants to start a business. Uh, the idea being that not only can you get them past the uh, initial phase, but most of the clients I have are existing businesses that want to either at bare minimum sustain or grow, invest in their business and, and you know, ha have, a, have a better opportunity to make a living. The other thing that we do is low cost and in many cases right now more than ever free workshops geared toward those same small business owners, uh, all of which can be found on our Consonant Field website, which is tsbdc.org. Sounds like a commercial. I liked it. <laughs> I've had to repeat it once or twice. Uh, we're not the only TSBDC, by the way. I know this is strictly, obviously, for the fine folks of Hendersonville, but we have locations all over the state, all over the country. And it's, uh, as you guys could, uh, uh, could imagine, my last year, and it's not different than anybody else, but my last year has been radically different for the way that we operate and the uh, type of counseling that we've been doing. Nice. Well, so what are some of the advising topics that you offer? Advising topics are essentially whatever a small business owner wants to discuss. In theory, we have a wide variety of workshops that may be able to help a small business owner with whatever topic they're struggling with at that point. But with that being said, the most common topics I have been asked about uh, over the past you know, decade and a half are about marketing, making more money, or getting a loan, borrowing more money. Now, with that being said, most of the uh, topics we discuss are all over the place. If somebody comes in, uh, usually with one of those two uh, issues, it, it's more about cash flow. So we may end up talking about cash flow. How, what's, what's your expenses look like? How does it compare to the industry average? What's the, you know, what process of management or any do we have in place? And we can kind of pull apart and dissect anything that they've got going on. And what I've tried to make the analogy of it's a little like a, uh, a fitness trainer. It's not necessarily uh, an emergency room doctor visit, which is what a lot of people do like to treat us as. If you were to walk into the emergency room with, oh, let's, let's be gross here with a gaping wound that, you know, you're about to bleed out. You can't go in and get a Band-Aid or a pill to suddenly fix it. And that is what I get a lot of requests for. Somebody who, uh, they might have a gaping wound in their business, cash flow just pouring out left and right or all kinds of... Uh, you know, operating issues and uh, they're, they're looking for a quick fix. We don't do that. We're more like a personal fitness trainer where we can kind of meet with you on, put you on a plan and help guide you in your own specific way regularly. And I still recommend people get and pay for an honest to goodness business coach that will grab you by the collar and make you do the things you know you are supposed to do in your business. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things that, you know, we don't necessarily have the ability to do. I love the fact that we have a free service, but uh, in that case, uh, you know, I, I don't have that ability. We're, in that case, we're more of a catalyst to help push you along as you hit stumbling blocks. No quick fixes, but we can walk you through those, walk you through those steps. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are some of the up, up, up and coming training events that you have coming up? Well, with that being said, I'm going to cheat. You're going to see me look right over here to the left. I've got an no online social media and digital marketing workshop that has all the people in the world in it coming up in April. I also have a time management goal setting workshop that I'm teaching that has hardly anybody in it, even though that's what everybody wants to talk about when it comes to rubber meeting the road. It's not nearly as much fun. I uh, also have a workshop on how to prioritize your week to be more productive instead of busy uh, in uh, we also have a couple of another workshop that I have Jason Elkins teach uh, it's been roughly once every month or so on a uh, hundred cups Academy, which is a marketing workshop geared toward helping small business owners right now during the pandemic more than ever kind of figure out 
what uh, what their current issues are in terms of marketing, how to rebuild it, how to restructure it. It's not all about just doing online ads and Facebook and you know Instagram, <clears throat> although there's a lot of opportunity there with social media, but it's more about developing relationships and how to replicate that and how to scale that. It's uh, that's that's been one of the bigger demand topics that people have had. And of course, we always teach and have always taught a starting a small business workshop. What I have recently done that's a little bit different is to create an on-demand version of it. And that may be something I keep post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, I've taught it every once a month, every month. And that's, so if I have somebody that comes to me and John, uh, my cousin, John Alexander over here wants to start a business. The only request that we give him is to attend one of our starting a small business workshops. As you guys could imagine, we answer a lot of the same questions over and over. I say we a lot. We is me. Uh, me uh, only. And we answer the same questions over and over and over and over. Uh, and in order to best, you know, use our time and energy and have people come to that one workshop, get the information they need. And if they decide to move forward to schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with us, I've recently recorded it, made it on demand. So people don't have to wait until the following month to take that workshop anymore. So that is a new and cool development that we have had. That's cool. That's very I cool. Think so, so. so how do um, people register for these training events? Can they just show up or do they have to register online? Register online. Of course, you can just show up. Actually, right now you can't show up because we're not going to be here. Everything has been Zoom related. It looks just like what we are looking at now. So okay. if you find folks are doing me a great favor by most of you looking at me, making eye contact and interacting. Normally, when I've been teaching these workshops, I am talking to 19 black boxes that aren't just in my territory. Since you can sign up for it online, they're all over the state, uh, which can give you a complex if you're talking to 19 black boxes that will not make eye contact you with you or reply. Um, with that being said, what was the question you just asked? I got it. The register, go to our website, tsbdc.org. I always ask people to do that and to do these Zoom workshops. That's the only way you can get in. Awesome. Well, um, so how many, um, could you tell us any, some local success stories that you've dealt with lately? Well, I can, and primarily the type of uh, counseling that we provide is confidential. So let me give you the, the catch to working with a TSBDC. The only thing that if, uh, again, we'll use John as an example here, uh, if he starts his business, the only catch to working with us is that I follow up with him uh, afterwards and see if he started his business. Did he, did he invest capital? Did he hire anybody? And I put it in a cute little report, a stakeholders report. Uh, and every year we, I take that to people that uh, invest into the TSBDC. And I say invest, uh, the return on investment is that, that report. Uh, so I get most of my funding from the Small Business Administration, the federal funding. The only request that they give us uh, is to match that with local cash dollars, not federal. So in my particular case, Ball State gives me in-kind match with a space to do the work and a laptop and World Wide Web and all that sort of fun stuff. But then uh, they also kick in a couple of bucks. I have to go out every year, uh, me and Mr. Jimmy Johnston, and we'll, you know, uh, he, for his own fundraising purposes, me doing similar thing, go to chambers and city government, county government, uh, economic development uh, agencies, uh, and even uh, tonight, I'll I'll be going and making a presentation right there in Hendersonville uh, to say, hey, here's this report. This is the only thing you know. This is what we what we have to tell you fine folks about. And you know, uh, even though the advising is confidential, I get a few folks to let us brag about them. Uh, one that I bragged about forever is Cafe Rocca, who is a uh, when they came to see me, it was a startup, oh, I think in 2008. Uh, Riyadh and Linda Alkinson came to our starting a small business workshop and they had the idea for a Mediterranean uh, restaurant there in Hendersonville. They didn't have anything else like it. Riyadh grew up in Syria, cooked with his grandmother his whole life and had all of these recipes. Now he and Linda have a, a really varied background. They had owned a couple of different things here and there and had corporate uh, training, but they had never done this. Now, that being said, I'm not a restaurant expert, but I knew all the steps they needed to walk through in order to start a business, how to get organized, how to get them, you know, how to invest capital into their business. And, uh, you know, for, for you guys that have ever been there, you know, they do a fine job, an excellent job uh, with the food. And 
they've learned as they've went along, you know, how do we structure this thing? How do we grow it? I mean, for a restaurant, you guys can understand the success rate for those. It's not through the roof. The average success rate for a start of small business period is only about 50%. And that's according to the SBA. Uh, that's, that can even be considered to be high. Uh, most, most studies I've seen are as closer to 30 and 40%. And then um, restaurants usually tend to be a little lower. They've been open for well over a decade now, same location. They've added a food truck. Um, you know, and their claim to fame was really giving them a shot in the arm is when they got on diners, drive-ins, and dives. And I don't know if you guys ever uh, watch uh, the repeat version of it, but that's anytime you see them pop back on in a, a rerun, you almost can't get in there. I think the Oak Ridge Boys had a nice hand in that. And then the guy at the Eddie must be tight going out and eating food all over the place. But that's a recent success story. They've been rocking and rolling through, uh, through the pandemic, and they pivoted uh, as much as I hate that word. They pivoted. Yeah. Uh, I found a way to get food, uh, you know, to go to, to uh, uh, be delivered. And, you know, they, they work well, right on through, right on through where we are now. And they're like, most folks are probably not exactly where they want to be, but they're in a, they're in a better place than most. Absolutely. We're all getting there slowly, but surely we're getting there. Um, so what are some of the top 10 reasons businesses fail? Well, it's funny you should ask. <laughs> um, and I'm going to use my little cheat sheet here. So in, in a lot of cases, whether it's an existing business or a startup, uh, first and foremost, it's going to be a lack of, of experience. When I say a lack of, a lack of experience, it's really kind of unfair. Uh, how do you ever get experience at starting and running a business until you've done it? I always equate it to parenting. I got three kids, 12, 9, and 8. We read all the books, did all, talked to all the peoples uh, before we had that first baby and learned as much as we humanly could. Uh, but it's nothing like actually having that first baby, the sleepless nights, the crying and not knowing what it's for, the being elated one minute and devastated the next. So you have to continue to uh, learn that. And most small business owners, when they start a business or even when they're growing a business, their experience is still limited to whatever they're translating from the corporate world or whatever else they were doing. And you have to continue to build on that. Uh, next being is that a lot of folks start out with a little, too little capital. And that can be something that haunts their business forever. I always tell folks, before you launch a business, create a laundry list of all of the items you need, not just asset equipment wise to start the business, but working capital wise. I'm working with one right now, confidential, not in this county, in another, and want to open a cool thing, uh, restaurant, retail, -y, and it, right now it's all in their head. They gave me a four page business plan that's cute, but doesn't have any details to it. And their startup projections, even without look, even just the number, I know it's too low. So that's what I'm coaching them on right now. Let's put together a cash flow. Let's look at the startup costs because if you start up with the cash that you have now, I can't guarantee that you know you'll fail. But the opportunity for success is truly limited. So you got to know that you've got enough capital starting out to pay the bills until we have enough cash to actually pay the bills until we break even. Uh, and if you don't do that, that leads into reason number three, poor cash flow management. If you do not have a home personal budget that you follow, or you at least have some good spending habits that you already have in your life, adding a business to it won't make it better. It will make it exponentially worse. Adding a zero to your income doesn't solve things. In many cases, it, it has a tendency to create a new stumbling block. So even though you can be making more money than you've ever made, you're going to be spending more money than you've ever made. You have to manage that cash in and cash out. I highly recommend another conversation I had yesterday, different, uh, a client that has a side hustle, another term I've learned to dislike, but good call, a side hustle that's really grown to a point where it can be a full-time business. No accounting system though. So when I talk to them, how much did you gross? How much did you net? What's in, you know, what, what's the fixed expenses for, insurance and, and market. I don't know. Uh, so they're, they're, they're already running at a negative. They are losing money on a business that should, you know, have 10, 15, 20% cash flow, but they don't know why, because there's no set system in place. So those top three things out of the gate, 
you got to keep learning about it. You got to get the cash in place. And then you got to measure it in and out. Uh, and the big one, probably the biggest one that affects existing owners more than uh, as much or more than uh, startups is a lack of planning. Um, any of y'all ever been to Disney World? Yes. Yeah. Everybody's going to go there here soon. Um, no, I'm so okay. just told you I got three kids. Uh, and uh, it was probably five years ago, the wife decided that we needed the real Disney experience. We were going into the Magic Kingdom. We were staying in a resort. We were doing the full-blown thing. I guess she didn't want to send all three of our kids to college, which is fine. Uh, we spent all the monies in the world. Now, it is not, you know, it's a one-week vacation. There's some moving parts, but you're staying on the resort. And you're just riding rides. Can't be that complicated. Now, my wife, the planner that she is, uh, she's a, an accountant and bookkeeper by trade, had created multiple spreadsheets. I'm talking about spreadsheets that were color-coded, that had formulas built into them. And every day uh, she had a plan of what we were going to do, what, when we were going to get there, what breakfast we were going to go and get signatures for the kids from Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse. Uh, and, and we all had matching coordinating shirts every day. <laughs> she had put more planning into this seven day vacation than a lot of the small business owners that I know do into starting and growing their business. Most people's version of planning is talking, thinking, praying, and then that's kind of it. I don't want you to over plan. I don't tell people they need to have a five year strategic plan with a mission and vision statement and it, because that, that, that does go out the window right away. But I do tell folks, you have to think ahead. This is 2021. What's your, what's your goal for revenue this year? Well, how much do you want to net? Right, you know, right specifically how you're going to market your business this year, what people you're going to add, what roles they're going to take on, how you're going to measure, you know, accounting wise, what your money in and money out, put that together. It's a plan. It, and it, you won't stick to it. You'll change and deviate. Uh, but, you know, the, the old saying is, you know, um, oh, I don't know the old saying without, Help me out, somebody. Without a, pl a plan, without a goal is a wish. Uh, what, did, what did the Cheshire cat say? Uh, One of you know. That's fine. I don't know. Any, well, it's from Alice in Wonderland. Without you know any road, if, without a destination, any road will get you there. Anyways, that's fine. I'm glad you recorded this. Everybody can see <laughs> that word. You got to have some sort of fashion of a plan, folks. Uh, poor location. There's a place. A couple of places, Hendersonville specifically, that has a new business in it every year, every other year. Wide variety of reasons. Could be that they're on an old Native American uh, burial ground and it's cursed and we should have we should have never built there. But more than likely, it's because of uh, poor location. No parking available. You can't put up signs. I can't make a left-hand turn out of the parking lot without having to say a prayer first. Don't go into the wrong location. If you are currently in the wrong location, it's incumbent upon you to save up, find the right location, pay more in rent if you need to, and uh, just bite the bullet in knowing that the poor location will never get good. Uh, competition and marketing. These are the next S, five and six. Number five, competition. Most people do not uh, really take the time to understand who else does what they do or why they are different. Um, you guys ever heard of Sam Walton? Smiling and nodding, yes. He's the, uh, he's, he's the founder of Walmart. I don't know if you ever heard how he got started. He didn't just start in a, uh, with a super Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas. He actually got, got going in Missouri, moved down to Arkansas and opened a five and dime shop. And he had a five, you know, it was a little general store on the square, kind of looked like everybody else's. Well, old Sam, uh, as sophisticated as he was, did something really smart. He took a uh, pen and paper and he walked into every other little store and he'd make notes. And I'm not suggesting you walk in the store and do that now. Somebody may, somebody may punch you. But Sam got away with it. He would look at, for example, uh, Colgate. What, what was Colgate priced at? Where was it on the shelf? Was it on the end cap? Uh, what time did the shipments come in? What were the employees doing? And he made all these minor modifications to his store until he could beat people on certain prices, uh, some areas and make up for it in other areas. And he would continue checking out the competition all of the time to find out what customers liked, what, didn't, what they didn't like, and how he could be a little unique and a little different. 
He modified and changed it, modified and changed it all the way, you know, up until the man uh, had fully retired, still served on the, you know, board of directors. Mm -hmm. And he would make his family crazy because he would take them on vacation. Once you become a billionaire, you buy a plane, apparently, and you become a pilot because that's a requirement, I guess. And he would fly his family all over the country, taking them to see, you know, uh, uh, different places. But he would always make them a little crazy because he would still take uh, a little trip into Sears or Target or JCPenney or wherever and make little notes, send them back to the board of directors. And we have access to something good old Sam didn't have most of his life. What do you guys think that is? Internet? Yeah, we're doing it. The World Wide Web. How neat. He didn't have that advantage. And most of us, when you look at, and I'll pick on uh, financial advisors or insurance agents, pretty easy to pick on. Uh, lots of them out there, lots of good folks doing great work. But if I check out 10 financial advisors' websites, I can almost guarantee you I'm going to see virtually the same thing each, on each and every site about, you know, being a fiduciary and holistic planning and doing what's best for you and creating a plan for the future, keeping your money safe. Uh, and it'll look like that on each and every site. And it'll have the same kind of stock photo and the same color scheme and the same jargon and have all the words in the English language. Uh, and even the elevator pitches will look fucking talk and sound the same. But if you get uh, in financial advisors in the room, you really get to know them. They all have a different philosophy, a different take, a different pitch you know they're different they're different people uh, so when you're checking out the competition do not copy what they are doing most of them are doing it wrong uh first and foremost uh, but secondarily you want to uh make sure that you have a, a unique selling proposition versus what they have uh, so you you know they they get you into market so that's the next step most people do not know who their targeted customer is their targeted customer could be you know sticking on the same point well the financial advisor well anybody that wants to save money or retire one day well that's everybody and if i'm talking you know to aaron and she wants to start a boutique here in town it's a high-end boutique that sells all kinds of the home good stuff you can see on uh, uh chip and joanna's new show whatever it's called on whatever channel it is um thanks forever. Wants, what's that mm -hmm. Fixer Upper? Fixer Upper, but now they have a cool new show somewhere Oh, they have else. a new one. Okay. Yeah, they moved to like Paramount and got all cool on us. But if you have a boutique and it has that type of stuff, but it's high end, you know, if I talk to Aaron, so who's your customer? Well, could be just anybody. I mean, we have men and women and they're all ages and some are married and some are single. Could be true. Could be true. But on average, if she were to take a look at her top 10 clients coming through, it's probably going to be more women than men, probably going to be more affluent than not, more than not will be married. You have a targeted customer base. You guys ever been to McDonald's? One or two of you, a couple of you today, and you don't want to admit it? I understand. <laughs> so if I'm thinking of McDonald's, a 25 to $30 billion company uh, with locations all over planet Earth, you think of their targeted customer, and I'm telling you this, having just told you I got a 12, 9, and 8-year-old. Who do you think their targeted customer is? Anybody? Everybody's on mute. They're all screaming. That's right. They're targeting kids. Yeah. Now, they still have broadened their horizons and tried to change up the menu, but it's still pretty old school. That's why they had the Happy Meal Play Place and that Creepy Clown, because the kids love that stuff. And if a business that size can have a targeted customer, so can you. So if you're direct to consumers, is it more male or female? Are they, where are they located? And what's their buying criteria based on? And that's what you call customer cycle graphics. So most people think it's a quality and price. That's really not the case. Think about any time you purchase something. Is it always, are you always just buying the cheapest thing? Or are you always buying the most high quality item? In some cases, there's a mixture of that, but more than not, each buying criteria that you have is based on you know uh maybe it's status or maybe it's convenience it's unique things that are to you the targeted customer that they should be wanting to work with so think about that in if you're business to business same concept i want to uh work with a certain type of industry not just any business but maybe i'm targeting service-based businesses or a product-based businesses and what size are they where are they located how many employees do they have and then once you figure out who your target market is, you know, why you're different than the competition, then you create an actual marketing plan, a strategy, and then you stick to it. Uh, most people do not have a marketing budget. The budget is whatever's left over, and that will get you leftovers. 
most of the businesses I work with should probably have about a three to 5% uh, of their revenue spent right back in the market. And most do not. They're at a half percent, a one percent. They don't track it at all. Their version of marketing is randomly posting stuff to Facebook uh, or having the dreaded intern just randomly shoving stuff online and then wondering why people don't see them as different or know why they are unique. Uh, your target market is going to react to your message based off why you're different than the competition in three or four uh, specific channels. And each channel is not going to be the same. Everybody is not going to live and die on Facebook and Instagram. It could be, if it's online, maybe it's, maybe it's LinkedIn, if it's business to business. If it's, as we roll back into person, maybe you need a sales force. Maybe you still need old school print media. Maybe a dozen other ways will work, but it's got, you've got to think through those two first items uh, before you do that. And when you create these marketing activities, they have to become habit. They have to be regular. They have to be consistent. I have coached and begged and pleaded with people to use an electronic calendar. Take your marketing activities, make them recurring on your electronic calendar and don't let anything interrupt them. Your business really just does two things. You create the widget or you you know, you perform the service, but the other thing is selling it. And too many people don't want to participate in that portion of it. They don't want to deal with the marketing of it. You have to create that marketing activity uh, and treat it almost like a doctor's appointment. And when I say you treat it like a doctor's appointment, you don't move it for anything. Um, for example, yesterday, I got my first COVID vaccination. By the way, this left arm can't use it. Hurts. But if something had popped up right then and I needed to answer an email or had an upset customer, or there was a meeting, I wouldn't have went. I was stuck to the vaccination because it was important to me. Same concept for you with marketing. Do not get too busy to do it. That's the thing you're supposed to be doing. So when I say treat it like a doctor's appointment, you don't move it. Or if you do move it, uh, or if you erase it, you must replace it. I stole that from somewhere. I think it's the one thing. Great book, by the way. If you erase it, you got to replace it somehow, some way, and you've got to put in that time and effort every week. That will cover a lot of uh, the other sins. Last uh, three here, uh, one of them being... Hold up, let me back up. You guys unmute yourself and I want you to fill in the blank. Then you can go back to mute and do whatever other 15 things you might be doing. If you want something done right, you got to do it. Right. Yourself. yourself. I can see you guys mouthing it. Yourself. 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 <laughs> All right. Right. Here oh, becomes yeah. the issue. If you want to scale a business, you have to be able to delegate and automate and that just has to become part of what you do so if you want the business to exceed whatever income you currently have you can't really do it by yourself doing all of the tasks and unfortunately so many people have it in their mind i'm not scaring people <laughs> sorry i was reading the message there <laughs> if you want if you want to be able to grow the business beyond Whatever you made at your last job, you're going to have to learn to delegate things. Delegation means that it will be imperfect. Somebody else has to do the thing you're doing. Uh, and, and you'll find in a lot of cases, they can do it, A, better than you. And B, even if they don't do it to the exact level of perfection that you do, that has freed you up to do a higher priority task. Like that marketing, that following up the leads, the selling, the figuring out where do we want to be? How do we add a zero to our revenue? You can't do that. If every day, as soon as you wake up, you start checking your phone at 6 a.m., getting in your email, getting in your text messages, multitasking all over the place, putting out fires. There's no way to operate. You got to be able to delegate. When I say automate, we live in, as much, as much as everybody begrudges that we live in one of the best times humanly possible to own and operate a business based off of whatever you think you know knowledge-wise or expertise-wise. There's tons of tools to automate what you are currently doing whether that's data entry, whether it's marketing, even, even sending out tasks for other people to do. I mean, anything that you do now that is a uh, task that somebody else could do for 10 to $15 an hour, super simple. You don't have to be an expert in training. You can, you know, if it's on, you know, you're using a computer, do a screen capture of it. Pay somebody else to type out what you just mumbled and then take that and hand it off to somebody else who a uh, virtual assistant that doesn't even need to be in this country 
to just knock it out for you. Check in on them, retrain, and turn them loose, and then you go handle the more important tasks. For most of you, the delegation probably needs to be within the bookkeeping realm. Most small business owners are not bookkeepers. It's not even that they don't have the ability. They just don't try. Uh, they just pile it all up, use the shoebox of hope, hand it to the CPA on April 14th every year, want them to wave a magic wand. First of all, then you don't know where your business stands at any one given point in time. That's you, you can't you can't win that way. But uh, more importantly, uh, you know you, you can't make adjustments and, and figure things out. Delegate these things uh, immediately. Personal use of business funds number nine. That means you're spending the money that you've been making back on the, you know, in, in your regular life, which is good. You've earned it. You should be able to do it. But I tell people not to spend any money back into the personal funds until they get the business locked and loaded at break even point. Uh, and they are thinking through it on a recurring basis where they're not eating up their funds with, um, you know, uh, the, the next, the next joyous thing that they think they've earned. A lot of people get doc itis. I've heard Dave Ramsey, uh, talk about this doc, doctors after eight years of school and four years of residency, uh, and, and tons and tons of student loan debt, uh, may sometimes as soon as they start making a few bucks, go out and get the big house and the BMW because they feel like they've earned it in some way. Maybe they have, but they haven't got the dollars to match it yet. Entrepreneurs are the same way where we get really excited. We've worked hard. We've been doing 80, 90 hours a week for two, three years. And we're finally at a point where the business feels stable. So now instead of a seven day trip to uh, Disney World, now we're doing a 14 day trip to Hawaii, even though we can't afford it yet. Reinvest into the business first. And then last but not least is unexpected growth. And I know all of you guys probably have a tale of a small business that has, you know, done, done well uh, and then done so well, they take on more clients than they can possibly handle. And they uh, outgrow, uh, you know, consulting be a great, you know, discussion on this point. If you know somebody else that's consulted, but they take on more clients than they can serve or they uh, have employees, but then they burn them all out because they haven't, you know, haven't been trained and they're, they're uh, getting more to do than they can possibly handle. Uh, and their cash flow gets really messed up because they're, you know, carrying an accounts receivable and they're taking on more work that they haven't performed yet. They haven't been paid yet. So those are the top 10 reasons, some to me more important than others. Uh, but those are a lot of the things I work with quite a bit. Well, thank you for sharing. I feel like we could go on and on and you just have so much information. <laughs> we could. I know you've got some questions here before we wrap up. I know. I've made a note here to kind of wrap back up with this thing in terms of discussing what I know, which changes daily about SBA, BPP, idle, and shuttered venues and restaurant recovery. But uh, we'll, we'll hand, handle that as, as after we uh, take on whatever questions we've got here. Okay, so I have one here. Will you evaluate financial health of a business, particularly relating to business entity and or business taxes? Taxes. Glad somebody asked that. Two things we don't do at a finance, uh, small business development center is tax advice and legal advice. Now, with that being said, I have reviewed people's profit loss statements and cash flows from day one, and I am more than happy to. Usually when I get this question, unfortunately, that means they don't really have a profit loss statement or a cash flow or not one that's up to date. At that point, when I, you know, we, we do referrals, send folks out to, a, I'll give them a list of uh, bookkeepers and CPAs that they should chat with. Uh, with that being said, I've got a really cool software I never get to use. It's called ProfitSense. You can come in here with tax returns and a year-to-date p &L. I can plug it into this fancy uh, system and it will give me uh, a whole list of, uh, um, areas where you're doing well and areas that could use improvement uh, based off of comparing you to industry average, your gross profit, your net profit, how much you spend on personnel, rent, uh, and uh, marketing. How does that compare to the industry average? And even it'll crunch ratios if you have a balance sheet. Most small business owners don't. Uh, but if you have a balance sheet, we can figure out your, gosh, your current ratio, your debt service coverage ratio, all kinds of final uh, things that we can point out that uh, most folks can't get to do. Thank you. Um, what is the general rule for startup capital? Six, nine, 12 months, question mark? There is no startup rule that I'm, I'm comfortable with. And I say that six months, uh, if it just has to be a rule of thumb, that's why I'm always big enough people completing a cash flow before they ever walk through the door. 
And if, if they were all always in my ideal world, and I already said I don't like the term, but I would love to see people start a business on the side, side hustle this thing to go get a proof of concept, to start it, to break it, to fix it, break it, fix it until you can kind of get something rolling. Build it up to a point where uh, you are where you can't do it anymore, and then leave the full time gig, and then jump into it. Uh, but what I what I do, I have worksheets. So if Jimmy Johnston here wants to. He he's had enough of forward thunder. He's going to become a landscaper. This is the year, man. I'm cutting it off. I'm getting on the mower, and that's it. I'm going to put in my earbuds, and I'm going to mow yards all day. Sound good, Jimmy? That was last year. That was pandemic. Sorry, he already got past that point. But before he does that, what I want to do is sit down and say, all right, Jimmy, this is, you're going to buy the mower, the weed eater, whatever other equipment that we need, and let's create a 12-month cash flow projection. And it's a projection. That's, that's just, you know, it's a guesstimate. But you can use some real-world common sense ways to come up with the projection and say, you know, in month, you know, July, August, September, October, we're going to ramp up, and then it ramps back down, and then it ramps back up. Take a look at your fixed expenses that goes. And what we see as you ramp the business up is a shortfall. And you're supposed to in a lot of cases. You don't make money right out of the gate. You, you have to build the business. Whatever that shortfall is over a 12-month period to whoever, uh, uh, the rod, that's how much money we need. Uh, so guessing, you know, three, six months, I don't know. But if I do that 12-month cash flow projection and I can see that I'm, you know, I'll need $30,000 just to, keep the lights on at my house and, you know, keep the kids in school and food on the table, then I don't start without that $30,000. If I don't have that $30,000 extra on top of what I've already spent, then I don't start yet. Or I start on the side or I change my model. Um, thank you. That was great. Well, how can the chamber help you? Is there anyone specifically that we could refer to you that you would want to talk to immediately? So the people that I can help are, is the chamber, whether it's chamber or members of the chambers, you get questions from people that say, you know, they're, they're stuck or they're, they need to figure out what their next steps are, what, whatever the topic, marketing, management, financial needs, or they just want to get started. That's, that's where we can come in and help. And it doesn't mean that we can fix or work with any and everybody under the sun, but worst case scenario, I redirect them to somebody else. Uh, so if they, somebody says, you know, I need help with my market, somebody sells, says we're growing and we're kind of all over the place and I can't keep organized. That's who we help. If they want to start. That's who we help. Uh, just give them our website and they can either take a workshop or they can sign up for one on one advising and then we can take it from there. Is that one on one advising with you or do you have a team? Yeah. I am the team right now. You are the uh, team. I have been the team primarily. I used to have. On a monthly basis, I would travel across the pond, so to speak, to Wilson County and set up shop for a little bit at Mount Juliet and uh, Lebanon, primarily because I don't get over there nearly as much as I should, and it's part of my territory. Uh, and I've had counselors over the years. I've, had, I've got one still, I hope, uh, um, that will I'll be you know, putting, putting back out there as soon as the world opens up a little bit, but no, they'll talk to me. Okay. Well, Charles, I think that's all the questions I have. Did I miss any anybody's question in the chat? Okay. Let them go ahead. Uh, let me, before I forget, um, PPP, second round payroll protection plan program, doesn't matter. PPP is on the second round, folks. It goes until May 31st. If uh, you had a dip in your business for any quarter, uh, and I say quarter, three month period, uh, between 2020 and 2019, if your business had a dip, even if you made more money, if your business had a dip of three months together, uh, you can apply assuming you have used the first round PPP, can prove that you used the first round. Ideally, you'd be forgiven for it, although I don't think it's a requirement yet. You can go and apply for a second round PPP. And if you haven't applied for first round, there, there's still an opportunity to do that. And I don't even, you know, that'll be based off of, uh, uh, to uh, 20, 2019 or 2020 numbers, and it's still there and available for you. Idle is still there and available for you. And some of you are getting emails right now. Idle, the economic injury disaster loan. Uh, they're going back to people who already got the first idle, and it's a loan. You cannot get forgiven for it. Um, but 
but it's a 30 year, no, 3.75%. I may have butchered that. Uh, but they, they capped it at $150,000 the first go around. Well, now they're opening it up. So if you were a business that was big enough to obtain higher than a buck 50, you, they, they are following back up with you. That's a real email if you're getting it. Two things that people don't know about, uh, first and foremost, is today there is a grant. The SBA has never liked to use the word grant. I don't like it when they use the word grant because people all, all of a sudden think there's grants to start a small business, and they're still not and probably not going to be. Uh, but there are grants for shuttered venues, and which it means in plain English if you had a, an event center, a museum, a movie theater. If you made your living by people coming and being in your location, uh, you can apply today on the SBA's website. There's some steps you got to go through, folks. It's great. If you've never had to apply for one, you're about to get schooled in it real quick. It's not much fun, but it's they are giving out grants for people who had to shut down, no questions asked, because they couldn't reopen, uh, and then they're basing it off the difference in their revenue in 2020 to 2019. They are putting together and will be releasing soon. Don't have a date yet. Same thing for restaurants or any food-based business. The shuttered venues... Big deal. It is a big deal, but if you're thinking about Hendersonville specifically, that's a handful of businesses, really. I mean, you can probably count on both hands the number of people that would affect. Restaurant-wise, totally different story. So once that become comes to fruition, I'm going to be sending out uh, an email as much as humanly possible, not just to the you know to the chambers, but to also my own email list and to all of you fine folks to let them know that restaurants will have the opportunity to get. I think they're calling a restaurant recovery grant. It'll be somewhat based on if they lost money from 2019 to 2020. Uh, there's a few that didn't do that because they were awesome. Uh, but the ones that did do that will get will get uh, get a chance to actually get some money back in their pocket. Okay, cool. Um, well, we, we're having some more questions come in. Um, I have one. How can we as professionals get involved in providing support to help with consulting or training? Well, as it stands, if you have a particular uh, training topic that uh, you feel is uh, something that we don't offer that you're getting a lot of questions for, uh, shoot me an email at Charles. What is my email? <laughs> Woo, I'm losing my mind. Charles dot Alexander of all state dot edu. Uh, and we can see about trying to offer that uh, workshop currently. Uh, that that's the best way that I've been able to help. And I've had a ton of folks, uh, guest speakers, many of them over the years, kind of like what you guys do regularly as well, to uh, not just give them an opportunity for exposure, but to uh, have somebody different come in and talk about a different topic. That's the main way. Uh, and then not to jump, jump ship here, but I got the chat open too. Jimmy's asking about uh, PPP uh, for gig 1099 folks. They can apply as well. So anybody that is, and that's sole proprietor. So anybody that's a sole proprietor that doesn't have employees that fills out just a regular uh, Schedule C or 1099 worker, even as far down to the Uber driver. I say far down, that sounds terrible. Even your Uber driver uh, can still apply for that first round PPP. Uh, more, import, uh, more importantly, first round, they changed the rules on that. Uh, back this time last year when I was helping people apply for it, it was based off of what they paid payroll, uh, you know, divided by 12 over 12 month period, then multiplied by two and a half. Uh, that's what they could qualify for. That's corporate level. If it was a sole proprietor level, it was based off of their net profit. If they were the only employee, uh, that's what they could do. Now they changed it. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to wish they would have waited to apply, but how would they know? Uh, to, you can either use your, if you haven't got first round yet and you're by, filling out a schedule C, whoever that is, uh, if you're, First round, you can either do it on 2019 or 2020, either one, tax returns, and then you can bake it off your gross. So take your gross, divide it by 12, multiply it by two and a half. And for a lot of people, that's a, God, that's a big number. Uh, and that that's that's the new rule for that now. Okay. Charles, is there a specific place in the PPP? Uh, I guess the question is, uh, are they using the same application as they would for, say, a not-for-profit doing a PPP? They all have different applications at this point. A sole you, proprietor, I say sole proprietor, gig worker is going to have a different one from a corporation, from a nonprofit. Can, can you put, uh, But in any of those, which you're, you're applying for a PPP through a lender. 
So yeah. you can go get the uh, application from the SBA website, but I would only use that as a frame of reference. Don't fill yeah. it out and then try to send it to the SBA. So I would, yeah. I would find uh, whatever local lender you can. Uh, and, and I'm, I don't, uh, Pinnacle's been doing a lot of them, not to favor them versus anybody else. I just top of mind because that's the last one I dealt with. But there, there's several out there that are doing PPP loan. Yeah, First Horizon. Yeah, yeah. Great, great call. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's I think it. that's it. Unless anybody else has anything else. Question. I'm unmuting myself. Oh, okay. I was like, I have a question. I was raising my hand, and my video was off. <laughs> hey, Kathleen, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, Charles. How are you? I'm good. You look great. Thank you. I feel great. And I will see you tonight. I'm not supposed to, so don't tell my doctor, but I will see y'all um, later today. You did a wonderful job today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question. We had a lady on the call from uh, a few weeks ago um, from SBA. So if people have specific PPP questions or any of the, the, the grant non-grant questions, whatever we want to call it. Yep. Um, she had said that they could reach out to her. Would you rather them reach out to her or reach out to you? Is there, how do you work with the local SBA? We work, we're tight with them. We have meetings with them every week. Uh, this is a good, they've all been good groups. The most recent SBA crew they have in there, they're legit. They're really good. Uh, either way, no, I'm more than happy for you to reach out directly to her because I get my information from them. So they have to come and teach me. If she's in, they're more than happy to take people on directly. If it's anything with these, with these type SBA CARES Act stuff, feel free to go directly to them because I'm 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 learning on the fly from them. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify that. So if you're if you're watching today and you didn't see her segment, it is saved on our Chamber YouTube page. So go to our YouTube channel and and view what she said as well in comparison to with what Charles said also um, because they're both fantastic resources for you and your business. They both can help you so much. Uh, but like you said, Charles, things this is all new. This is all new to her. So she may have the information too, but um, we're all learning as we go. You know, we've, we've learned a lot this year. So, um, but it's money that's available and we need to make sure our businesses are taking advantage of it, right? Correct the moon though. Um, so my last question is, if somebody is watching today and knows, everybody knows somebody that is in business, so maybe they didn't, um, they don't feel like they need to rush and call you immediately sure. um, for help, but who should they be looking out for? Because I think we all need to help each other and we all need to kind of um, comfort each other, especially in the recovery process as we bounce back from everything. Who do we need to be keeping our eyes open for um, and referring to you? What type of businesses do you think you want to work with or need to work with the fastest to help them the most to rebuild our local economy? In terms of people that I have worked with, probably the most are uh, twofold. Uh, the existing business owner, uh, the one that's got uh, a couple of employees or five employees, 10 employees, right in that range, seem more service-based than not. Why that is, I don't know. Uh, uh, keeping organized and keeping things on track to where you keep running into obstacle after obstacle of what you are allowed to do or not allowed to do. Those are the people that I don't, you know, they haven't given up, but they, they, they've gotten to a point uh, or, or a level of frustration where they don't know what to do next. We've done a lot in, in terms of that type of business. And then startup wise, uh, only about 25% of the businesses I've worked with are startups, but I swear this past year, one of the reasons I decided to create an on-demand version of the Starting a Small Business Workshop, people are coming out of the woodworks with startup ideas. Uh, and they're the most unique ideas I've seen. And I say unique in both the tongue in cheek sort of way and the, some of them are really cool. Mm -hmm. They're kind of all over the place, uh, more than I've ever seen before. And I don't know if people have just more time to think about it. I don't, either way, I don't, I don't know why and I don't need to know why. So those startups that are kind of, you know, they're in the talking phase and they don't know what to do. Those people got a workshop for them, answers their questions very specifically. Uh, with a ton of resources and then they can follow through as well on uh, counseling if they decide to. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for all you do for our community. And that does leave me, Aaron, I don't know if Charles has our business guide. So he needs our, our business development guide um, at the, at the center um, for when he's meeting people. Are you meeting people face to face again? I am not meeting people face to face again. I don't know when we will. I've been doing a lot of this. I uh, mm -hmm. hope to be meeting them at some point soon, but uh, so no, uh, I would be happy to have my own guy, but I don't have I don't have anybody to hand them to just yet. I'll bring you a few, but I'll also send you the link if that's helpful. That's helpful.
Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Erin, did you tell them who, who was going to be our call next week? Yeah, no, not yet, but I was about to. Mitch Graff, he's an author. Kathleen, can you tell, tell yeah, you know him, so. Yeah, he's a personal friend of mine. I used to travel in the speaking circuit with him. Some of you know that um, my past life, I, I traveled all over the world and um, spoke for different conventions. And this gentleman is a wealth of knowledge. He's a marketing guru. Charles, you will like him. Like you will be like an instant connection when you talk to him. Um, he has published several books. His average speaking gig, he gets ten to $15,000 when he goes out to speak and he speaks for large companies all over the world. So um, you need to jump on this call. His focus next week is going to be on leadership and how to build a level of customer service in your business and that will blow away everybody's expectation and um, be retention proof, you know, like that will that will take your business beyond. So he's really going to focus more on leaders. So if you know anybody that has a business that is managing a lot of employees um, or let's say more than five employees, they can benefit from being on this call. Um, I promise you, he will give you nuggets of information that will be very, very valuable to you and your business. So it's next Thursday, 8 a.m. Join us and be here. We look forward to having you join us. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Charles, for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. Thank you, folks. All right. Take Bye. care. God bless. Hey, Bye. Jimmy, this is Dave Mumy. Jimmy, you're muted. Sorry. Yes, sir, Dave. You sent me an email about hosting a meeting.